In the 1960s, many people thought that artificial intelligence is just around the corner. Even many researchers thought that in just 10 years' time, it would be possible to build computers that are as good as humans in every cognitive task. So now, 50 years later, it's easy to say that, well, that didn't happen. Um, we still don't have the AI that was um, promised to us in science fiction. But I have been in the field for 25 years, studying and developing artificial intelligence. And today, I'm here to tell you that artificial intelligence is just around the corner. <laughs> so, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, why we want to build this artificial intelligence, human-like computers that can do things that humans now only, only humans can do. And then I'm going to talk about the technology. What is it that makes humans able to do this stuff? Where are we now? How are we going to build that? And then a few words about how we can share the benefits of this new technology with everybody. In the 1960s, people were dreaming of these human-level computers that would power Android servants that do all the tasks that humans don't want to do and so that humans can spend time with their families and friends and do all the things that make life worth living. Instead, we got the internet and smartphones. They are great tools. I use them every day myself. But they are not quite what we were expecting, are they? Um, as an example, a few weeks ago I was traveling in London. I was planning to go from the, the railway station um, of the airport to the city. And I had booked my tickets with my mobile phone. Um, I was um, walking to the platform and there I was waiting for the train. But then the train was delayed. Okay. Uh, luckily, I, was, I wasn't in a hurry, but some people were worried about their schedules and they start frantically typing on their phones. And then they found there's a person, there's a conductor on the platform, and they were queuing to her. They want, asked her questions. She was able to reply each one of them immediately, clearly, and they were happy with the service. That's the kind of service we would like to have. That's the kind of help that our mobile phones now can't give us. In unexpected situations, humans are the only ones who can help. My mother, for instance, is suffering from using her mobile phone because nowadays many services can only be reached through mobile phones. She would like to talk to a human. So my goal is to build technology human-like AI that my mother would be happy to work with. So, let's have a look at what else we could do with this technology. Um, it's not just service, but there are many things that we are now doing with dumb technology. For instance, we're using a lot of energy and raw materials when we could instead use intelligence. We are making our environment pretty monotonous, so that our dumb technology can cope with it. We are even making our own working lives more standardized, so that all the processes can be worked, uh, all the processes work together with the technology that we have. All of this could change, if only we could build these more human-like machines. So we are not trying to replace humans most of the time, Actually, what we are trying to do is we are trying to replace the dumb technology that nowadays has automated many of the things that humans used to do. So, now let's look at this technology. Can we build it? What do we have now? In the 1960s, people were not only expecting to have these nice robots to serve them, but they were also afraid of robots rising against their creators. Like, for instance, in this uh, famous movie, 2001, Space Odyssey, the artificial intelligence, HAL 9000, rebels against humans. 
Researchers and industry was trying to educate people. No, 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 that's not how it works. That computers do exactly as they are told. No more and no less. That was true then. It was true for a long time. Internet smartphones are built based on that kind of technology. We call it programming. People then call it artificial intelligence. Nowadays, what we call artificial intelligence is something different. Because there are limitations to what you can do with programming. For instance, I'm seeing you now. I'm talking to you. You are listening to me. You understand what I say. All of this is very hard to program. And that's why when you try to build self-driving cars or you make uh, virtual assistants that understand speech or you try to translate language. Nowadays, we use something which is called machine learning. It means that you take a lot of data, you give, for instance, instances of images from, from traffic, and then you give also the desired outputs. These are cars, these are pedestrians, and so on. You take a lot of data and you build this algorithm. You program the algorithm that learns from the data. That's how AI works nowadays. So we can say that today, computers only do what they learn from the data. That's the reality now. And uh, this, is, this is how it is now. And some people think this is how it will be. There is something in humans um, that we can do much better than computers now. We are creative. We can respond to new situations. I'll give an example from um, um, Homo sapiens living his daily life, namely me. Um, I'm biking to work basically every day. And this is my way back home. Every day I take this biking lane and I turn right. A few days ago, we had visitors coming in for dinner and I needed to go buy groceries from a shop which was straight ahead. So, you guess where I was? I find myself almost at home. I had turned right. Neuroscientists and cognitive scientists have figured that there are like two kinds of, two modes of thinking in humans. They call it system one and system two. The system one is the autopilot. It's the it's the part of my brain that's doing biking, for instance. It's the part of my brain that took me right and almost back home. Um, it's very fast. It, it's intuitive. I don't need to think about it. In fact, I cannot think about it. I, I cannot explain how I do it. I just do it. It's unconscious. Fully automatic and crystallized knowledge. It's something that I learned from experience, from a lot of data. Sounds familiar, right? Very much like artificial intelligence these days. What we have now in AI is basically this system one. What we are missing is this creative system two, which is able to handle new situations. I was supposed to use this system two when I needed to make an exception and go buy ingredients for the great dinner. It was successful in the end, so no worries. My brain is able to imagine things. I, can, I have simulations going on inside my brain, and that's the foundation of this system too. This is what we need to build. There are some examples of AI systems that use this kind of system too. For instance, AlphaGo, built by Google DeepMind, a few years ago, um, they won uh, the world's best Go player. Go is a game which is even more difficult than chess. It's very famous, popular in East Asia. And this program, AlphaGo, and its successor, uh, AlphaZero, which uh, half a year ago became the world's best chess player, has a kind of system too. So what you do is you program in a game engine. 
So it's a fully programmed thing. Just programs has, have used that for ages. And you, you can use this for simulating the game. So given a board position, you can start simulating what, what could happen. And from that simulation, you create data. So the system, system two, the simulation, creates its own data. And then there is system one, which builds intuitions based on this data. Because the simulation itself can be used to decide how good this situation is, and also suggest new moves. That maybe, maybe that's a good move. And then these intuitions feed back to the planning process. An expert player doesn't need to think very many moves. A beginner will think, think about many, many different moves, but an expert player intuit intuitively knows that these are good-looking moves. I'll, I'll think about them only. So this is how System 2 in Alpha Zero will help System 1 develop intuitions, which in turn makes, uh, make the, makes the planning process perfect. This is something that we can do in games. But when we are, for instance, talking about traffic, self-driving cars, we can no longer build all the rules inside a computer. There is no way to build rules about how pedestrians work, for instance. So now we and others have started developing systems which can learn the rules of the world. They can learn the rules of the game, how the traffic works, how, how communication with people work, and so on. And this is the foundation of a new breed of AI, which is going to be here anytime now, uh, and which all of you will be able to use. It's going to be more human-like. It's going to be creative. It's going to be able to communicate. In communication, the important thing is transmitting these mental images. If you can't imagine, you cannot properly communicate. If you think, for instance, about that example that I gave in London, that queue of people uh, that w was trying to ask questions from the conductor. What I did, I was transmitting my internal simulations to you. You understood what I was trying to say. So these new computers, which are able to imagine, will be also able to understand us. So yes, we are building this technology. It's happening, and it's a good thing. So, always when there is technological change, there is also um, potential for not everybody being winners. Even though the grow, uh, even, even though the pie grows bigger, it's not clear that everybody will get a bigger share of the pie. So the most important thing we need to do with this technology is to make sure that we distribute the benefits of AI's labor to everybody. There are certain things that will work just as before. Our society already has social security and all of these systems in place. And many things like, for instance, the pension system, I think will work just as before. It's based on investing in companies and the companies will continue making profits so we can share those profits for everybody. But what about, for instance, labor? Now we are taxing labor and using that to fund our social security. Some people have suggested that if robots will take over some of the work that humans now do, we should tax the robots. Well, there's a problem. Here is an AI from the movie Her. Just in case you haven't seen the movie, here's the AI. It's not a physical thing. It's a, it's a voice in the ear. Artificial intelligence is immaterial, computation happening in some cloud. It's not possible to tax that. So I think there is every reason to be optimist. There's um, this new breed of AI coming, and there is a lot of good stuff we can do with it. So I started with asking, can we build this human-like AI? Yes, we can. And that's a good thing. 
Yes, we want to do that because there's so much good that you can do, it, do with it. So all of you, hopefully, in five years' time, for instance, will be able to use that AI and build good things in this society. But, yes, but, we have to be mindful. This technology is very powerful, and that means that it's also potentially dangerous. We need to make sure that we will distribute the benefits for everybody. If we do this right, the future will be bright. Thank you.